Hey, welcome back to the Lightspeed Lawn Care Marketing Podcast. I am sitting down today with one of my good friends from the green industry. If you have been in the business for a long time, you probably know him already. It's Mike Callahan with Simple Growth. Mike, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Cody, appreciate it, man. Uh, been trying to get in here uh, the last few weeks. Really appreciate having us on and uh, looking forward to the talk today. Yeah, yeah. So for anyone who has been following my content for a long time, like pre Lightspeed stuff, you know that Mike and I used to do a weekly live stream for Service Autopilot, and we have done a ton of content together. So it was really good to you know finally get him on my YouTube channel now that I have my own project going. So I wanted to talk to you today about automating your lawn care business, because I know that you did this so well with your business that now you have a whole other business that is solely focused on helping service business owners automate their business. So I just want to jump in and hear anything you've got to say. Yeah, absolutely, Cody. So uh, you, you kind of nailed it. We, we, in the early days, started a lawn care company. Uh, really freshman year in high school, worked all the way through high school. Uh, and believe it or not, had uh, at, by the end of college, had three full-time crews running around while I was actually a full-time college student. And then obviously kind of made that, that, that faithful jump as we all do. Is it the corporate route or is it the entrepreneur route? We, we went the entrepreneur route with the lawn care and snow removal company in upstate New York. And uh, I mean, a lot of people have heard the story, but if you haven't, I'll give you the 30 second rendition. Uh, basically all the people in my local town that uh, I looked at and admired who ran not only service businesses, but any business built these really great businesses from the outside, but they actually revolved around them and they had their hands in every part of it. But I assumed that that was the way to actually grow this business and to compound the problem. Um, some of the last classes I took in entrepreneurship in college were run by gentlemen that was running uh, several large companies. Believe it or not, he was he was the center of all the uh, movement and all those businesses as well. So I said, "Well, hell, that, that that's got to be the way to do it if you're going to crush it. You got to you got to micromanage it and uh, that grind, grind, grind to your you're dead, but that hustle. Uh, but eventually, that ended up causing a divorce. And uh, story short, hit rock bottom. Search the internet, how to get your life back from your business, and I found. Uh, automations and the five stages of business. And, and the interesting thing, Cody, and I don't know if we've ever talked about it, but the five stages of business really uh, was instrumental before we even automated the business because what it was, is it was built by Clay Mass and Scott Martin, the, the co-founders of Infusionsoft, which is now Keep. But as, as you go out on the internet right now and you're looking for what are the next bottlenecks my business is going to hit, uh, y- there's nobody out there who's really automated a service business and there's nobody who ever really talks about the growth and bottleneck hurdles of a small business. There's out there for hundreds yeah. of hundred million dollar companies, but as a service business owner of a lawn care landscaping company, uh, there's no roadmap. But it was really interesting that Clayton Scott, through hundreds of hours of research and census data, actually defined the five stages of business and where you were at based on how many employees and your revenue uh, and how many were actually in the United States on average that actually filed their taxes. But the cool thing is on the bottom, it said, this is the hurdle that you are going to approach across all these businesses up to a million and beyond. It, it landed on the threes and seven. So 100,000 or 100,000, 300,000 and so on, all the way up to three and, and 10 million. But basically there's a distinct hurdle. And the thing that Clay talked about in there that really resonated with me is once you get past that hurdle, you may not have solved that hurdle of bottleneck, uh, but it's always going to be there. Yeah. And the business owner dives in and now they want to own it and wrap their hands around it. What I found is through automations, you can at least up through about a million tackle 99% of those hurdles through an automated system. That was yeah. kind of the magic sauce. We automated, but we, we paid attention to those hurdles and that was kind of my roadmap. Yeah. So those, give us an example of one of those hurdles. But before we say that, I want to make sure people are hearing what you're saying here, that part of this is you can brute force your way around one of these hurdles, but it's going to consistently be a problem in the business until you actually address it. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that, that's the thing that, uh, I mean, I love Gary Vee and a lot of these influencers, but that, that hustle, grind, grind, grind a hundred hours a week, it's not sustainable. That's not a good work-life balance. And, and that's, that's not why we all started our businesses. We went into a help people and B make money and have a better lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, for most people. I don't know anybody who got into business to work seven days a week, 10 hours a day. That just is not sustainable. I want to um, be miserable. Yes, yeah, miserable. I'm going to, you know, I want to be hanging out in room 112 with the players dwell with Mr. 
Mr. Cody. But bring anyway, back. bringing it back. But basically, as you're going in, those five stages, stage one actually has an A and B. And in stage one A, you have a full-time job. And your biggest uh, hurdle is time. How do you have time to actually start a business while you have a full-time job? And then stage one B is you basically said the hell with the man. I'm going to go out and make money. I'm tired of him making money off my hard work. Literally, we know that business owner probably is not making as much money as he we thought he was <laughs> later, in, <laughs> later in the conversation as we get down the road. But your biggest hurdle there now is leads. And you can't just now rely on your friends and family, people from uh, you know the kids' baseball team or people you know or church or wherever you're hanging out. You actually got to get enough leads to, to, to keep the lights on. As you get into stage two, uh, your biggest hurdle now is sales. So if somebody's not clocking in full time from eight to five, eight to five, or nine to five, or at least part time, but while they're in that position, Cody, they've got to be um, having their sole focus on sales. So this is the amount of mm. calls or estimates or jobs. There's a clearly defined non-emotional goal that needs to be hit. And what we find, at least in my business and all the other businesses we work with, at Simple Growth, hundreds a year, is, is we get into this situation we sell a lot of work. And then we do a lot of work and it's, it's kind of like this teeter totter. So oh, I'm running out of work. I got to start sell, sell, sell. Now we need to do a lot of work, but really there needs to be a clearly defined sales uh, goal and cadence. And on top of that, the one thing that nobody really talks about is the ability to go in and have a predictable and delegatable sales system. So ideally we want to build a production rate based estimating system around turf square footage, linear feet, number of shrubs, small, medium, large, whatever that is, and be able to delegate that. At a bare minimum, we want to be able to at least base it on how many hours and minutes we think it's going to take with a, a minimum to show up if that's applicable to service to take the emotion out of it. So we've got a set sales system and we've got to have um, basically a standardized sales system that can actually have job costing around it. And as you dive into to level three now, so this is about to your, um, it's going to be your 300 to 700,000 ballpark right there. It's really going to be uh, people and systems. So now the scary thing is, Cody, we're going out and now we're hiring people that we don't know that are going out yeah. and doing the work while we're probably not with them because it's usually three to 10 employees. So unless you're running a 10 person crew, which would be kind of crazy, uh, you've got that workout. So you've got to figure out how do we get the standardizing operating procedures? How do we go out and hire these people we don't know? How do we vet them? I mean, how do we build the systems around it? And as you continue to go, there's very predictable uh, bottlenecks that you need to get around. Uh, but those are going to be the, the hurdles we've talked about up to a million. Uh, are, they can Most of those can be automated. And eventually, once you get past a million, it's leadership and culture. And what we find is the leadership skills that you have at a million are not the same leadership skills they got you there is not going to get you to three to five or 10 million. That's a whole different set of leadership skills. And now eventually those people that you don't know that you hired are hiring people they don't know. So it's, it's compounded. And then how do we go in and create a, a greater cause a mission, kind of that North star. So our, our mission at simple growth is to help business owners take their life back from their business. Everybody aligns to that. And now old saying is we got the right people in the right seats in the boss. And we're all driving in that one direction. And that cultural piece is what we're seeing in the Simple Growth Masterminds group uh, is we're helping help people clearly define a mission and mission strategies, how we're going to get there, but core values and how to actually hire, train and fire to the core values. And that's kind of the secret sauce mm -hmm. as we continue to go. As we well know, you young millennials aren't just about a paycheck. There needs to be a culture. There needs to be a greater good to where we're going. And that's uh, kind of the journey that we've taken with basically my two companies now and going on to a third, that there, there really is a recipe for your service businesses. Mike, talking to you is always so helpful. I am like taking mental notes for my own business right now, not just for the guys watching. I definitely identified what stage of the hurdle we are at. And it's a solution that I have known we need to implement for a while and have been I mean, literally doing what you described of like, I know we need someone in sales whose focus is sales. And I have just been pulling more and more onto my plate to handle that when I know that like, okay, this is the, the hurdle we need to address. And I just have, so this has given me the impetus to like, okay, I need to go get this problem solved for us. Yeah. And, that, um, and that's, it really is. It's, it's interesting. So you've got your time and leads, you've got your sales, marketing service, 
people and systems and leadership and culture is that three to 10 million. Mm-hmm. And I can, in show notes, I can get you a copy of what that actually looks like. Are we, is this actually going to be live on just the podcast or on YouTube or? This will be on our podcast feed and a video on YouTube. So okay. we can have a link in the show notes and we can throw it on screen for the video. Okay. Yeah. If you want, I can actually pull it up if you want as well. Oh, you for sure. That? Yeah, yeah. So we've got um, right here, and this is a presentation I just did um, in upstate New York here, but, the, but this is actually your your five stages of business here. We'll keep it short for the audio version. Make sure you check the show notes on this, but uh, that's that part one and two A and B. Our new employer is going to be running two to three employees running a hundred to 300,000 annual revenue. Our biggest hurdle is sales. Uh, and I misspoke. So our, our stage number three is service. We're hiring the people we don't know, but in addition, it's a marketing system and that's four to 10 people and three, 300 to a million. And that marketing piece really, uh, I'll give credit to John Potoshnik with the analogy, but, but really the idea is having a, a predictable marketing system with client acquisition. So if we know each one of our client costs us 120 bucks or say $100, we throw that $100 in the top of that vending machine where all our ideal clients are sitting in. For every 100 bucks we stick in the top, that ideal client kicks out. Okay. And then basically that's going to drive that sales machine that we've built at hurdle number two. Stage four, one to three million is that people and systems and then that leadership part we just talked about in the culture, that's going to come in at three to 10 million. But really what we're going to do is what I've seen is if we don't start building that leadership and culture as we break a million, it's going to be really hard to implement. So we really want everybody to buy and have a piece of that. So that yeah. That's kind of what we're looking at. I'll get you a copy of that for the show notes. But that thank you. this, this is the exact um, thing that I used in my business. And when I found that on, online, that was that was the foundational piece of where do we automate first in priority? Yeah. So talking about starting to introduce automation, I think you already touched on the first step of that is that you have to have a no emotion, like purely defined process in place where you can hand off the task to a person. That's like the first step to being able to figure out, can this be automated and it can be taken off of everybody's plate? Yep. Really, you're just you're kind of defining your biggest bottlenecks and pain points, and, and you can't eat the whole elephant. So you got to just take them as you do it. So what we do is we we include or we look at it as a process of life cycle marketing. A kind of new hot term is called life cycle automations. Now, really, we talk about where the person is in the customer life cycle, and the key, whole idea is we want to have an automated but personal conversation around this, Cody. So if you are a lead that's requested an estimate for lawn mowing you would be able to speak to them in the fashion of it's someone who's requested an estimate for this service, but hasn't yet received it. So we're going to send them some short-term education and nurture to educate them around the service and overcome any sales or price objections. So the key is not only do we want to automate those because these are all the manual processes. We got to figure out the manual processes first before we automate them. But once we do, we want to talk to specifically where they're at. Uh, So it's, it's personal, but then we automate it. And the whole idea uh, and we've re- reiterated that was working with hundreds of clients each year with these automations is a lot of times you don't want to have like crazy logos and pictures and all this stuff in these documents. And people are like, why do some of these documents look so basic? I'm like, well, they're going to tell it's automated. The whole idea of an estimate follow up or a welcome or, or an acclamation or say at 30 days, we follow up for quality control. You want it to look like it came from somebody who typed it in your office, not a branded up email. Because they're just going to yeah. like turn that off. As you're scrolling through your phone on social media, you know what an ad is. Like our brain has like been, you know, trained to what that looks like. So you don't want to get into that situation. And and that's that's kind of the key of when we build those automations. Yeah. So you're trying to keep it looking as personal as possible while allowing it to infinitely scale with the business. So you keep that top notch customer service, and you're building systems that ensure quality while, you know, making it infinitely scalable. That's really cool. Yeah. And something stupid is just literally email signature line we put on the estimate follow-up two days after each call. Looks like it's sent from the estimator's iPhone. Okay. So I talked about you doing that. And then I I had Robert pull it from a previous podcast episode because I like said your name and I was like, I don't know if Mike talks about that being a thing that happens. So I was like, I don't want to put him on blast, but I think that that is so powerful. It is. I remember the first time you showed me that we were on a call like this and you were telling me about it. And I was just like, man, that is wild. Yep. And that's, that's probably 
10 or 11 years in the making. And you know what? Mm -hmm. It still works. Yeah. It's a great hook. So walk me through, I'm a lawn care business owner who's doing, you know, well over a hundred K we've, you know, got a crew in the field. Maybe I'm off the truck. Now I'm in the office working on the business. What are the first things that I should be looking to automate? So I would say uh, basically right off the bat right now. So we're, this as we're recording, this is obviously well past COVID. Uh, first thing we want to think about is buying decisions or buying habits have changed. So on-demand buying is a thing. So Instacart, Amazon, Netflix, Uber, all of these things are digitally on demand right now. So the consumer, we want to think about before we necessarily automate it, how is the consumer buying and digesting and, and acquiring our services? So obviously email is not dead. It's still alive. You should have a website lead capture to request an estimate. There's certain services you're not going to be able to sell directly off your website. In addition, you should have somewhere to have an automated estimate. So it's tying in, it's pulling in property data that customer could fill in the service area, and it's going to reference a data table and calculate a price based on your, your services and your, your profits. They should be able to sign up and actually put a credit card on it and bill. Um, so the, obviously that's ideal, but if it's another service at a bare minimum, you really need a website lead capture, and that needs to go in and trigger a ticket or to do whatever software you're using. So whether it's Service Autopilot, Mike Andy's Copilot, those are the big ones right now, but those are going to, they're going to basically create a task with accountability for someone to be on the hook within 24 hours to, to get that estimate. Speed wins right now. That's, that's the key of the game. So that would be set up the automation to trigger that. And if they're buying live off the website, set up an automation to trigger the task to actually set up the job. Uh, and if we're requesting the estimate, uh, it's an estimate follow up. We call that 20 days to close. That's going to be yeah. the first biggest return on investment. The second biggest return on investment that we see right now is upsells. We recommend five to eight upsells. And the key to those, Cody, is, is not this like ugly email blast. So this is the thing that I, I, I chuckle because uh, I don't know how I've gotten into these email lists, but it's literally we're going into the springtime and it's literally like it's time to sign up for your spring cleanup. If you've already signed up, just disregard this email. Like, What are you telling <laughs> your client? You don't care about them. You're literally spamming your clients. Really, so the secret sauce to this is database segmentation. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't sound sexy, but man, the results are real sexy. So the idea is we want to go out over three communications, what we found the best results. And there's, there's two or three main things that you want in this upsell. So the marketing content itself, before we get into the segmentation, is there should be an email subject line or hook that actually grabs their attention and it ties into the first, I'm going to call paragraph of the, um, but it's, it's real quick and chunky, but it's a couple of sentences, but it ties right into the first paragraph. And then the bottom, we want the ability to click and to request an estimate and the ability to say, Hey, I'm not interested because if they're not interested, let's not hit them with the other two emails. So the marketing copy needs to be different across those three communications. And it should start about a month before the busy season starts and trickle right up to right when it starts for the people that are acting late and forget to do it or last minute folks. So that's kind of the idea, but to send that out and avoid the issue of, hey, if you already signed up, just ignore this. The automation shouldn't like bucket everybody up in this holding cell for 12 months before it comes. It should be a live sweep through. And the status is right mm -hmm. off the bat on a high level is, did they, or do they have an estimate in play already for that service? Has the service been done in X amount of time? So like if we just did the service last week, we don't want to try to upsell it again. Uh, is it on a waiting list? Or is it like currently dispatched in play? There's some other ones, but those are the big ones. But literally it should sweep through within about a minute before it sends out. And if it doesn't hit those criteria and it's a good good lead to be upsold, it goes out. And we're seeing in a, in a normal company that's running, I don't know, four to five half or four hundred to five hundred thousand or bigger with a decent database, about sixty to eighty estimate requests in the first twenty four to forty eight hours. It's just we absolutely huge. We do some of that for clients, you know, when they're like, Hey, we have this service coming up. Will you yep. guys put together an email campaign for us? And it, it's a money printing machine. Like these are people who already know you already trust you. It is so much easier to get those subsequent yeses than it was to get that very first. Yes. Yeah. And, that, and that's the key to it. I mean, that, and it, it's, so the, the biggest thing that we see uh, is we get these clients in here and then we, we, we just forget about them, but you've got mm -hmm. money sitting in your database. And it's not only just your clients, but
but it's your leads and your canceled clients that uh, that you'd want to market to. Now, there's a, depending on the software, there's different ways to hit do not market to them. But 80% of those people that cancel your service, Cody, are indifferent. They didn't like you. They didn't love you. They just, they, were, they weren't wild. Yeah. They're it still could be in the database. It could be their their 13-year-old decided he was going to take care of the lawn and he did, you know, a shitty job because he's a 13-year-old and they yep. want a professional back. It could be, you know, any number of reasons they left. Yeah. And then the last place where we're really, literally just taking money, like lost estimates or crumpling them up and throwing them in the trash figuratively or maybe physically for still pen and paper. Uh, those are all good people that we can still build into that database and do upsells to. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important to think about lost quotes as people you didn't successfully sell. They didn't say no necessarily. They just weren't convinced. And so you yep. can go back and work to convince them to come into the fold. Yeah, and that, that's the secret sauce, but da- segmenting the database and sweeping through to make sure it's relevant and personal to where they're at in the customer life cycle. That's the key to automations, especially yeah. now it is. Well, Mike, I know that you guys have a pretty exciting announcement over at Simple Growth. You have a new, new product coming online, and I want people to know about it because I'm very excited that you guys have, have brought this in-house. Yeah, so we uh, went out and actually acquired another software company who was already existing called Estimate Cart. Cody and Andrew did a great job with that. Um, and probably from October, November this last year up through as we're recording this now in April, we brought on three full time developers, front end, back end, and then somebody that um, was versed in both front and back end to manage the project. And he's been on the team now since basically almost day one. Bill on uh, the team is running that lead. Uh, we went in and, and, and took a great foundation of what, what the software was. Uh, and we're investing a significant amount of money uh, to relaunch this. So we've actually rebranded it as uh, Simple Estimate. And now we have full-time support, chat, and email right inside the actual product as well. Um, we're, we're going in and, and adapting into uh, the new shift in technology where things are going with AI. Currently right now, the product can pull in real estate databases. So it can pull in your square footage of the lot. And it also now has the ability to go in with your mouse or finger and trace in your client on your website. We'll be able to color in their actual physical service area. And that's going to reference your pricing matrices or data tables. And a lot of people are confused around that. That's what we do in the Simple Growth Consulting end is we help people build pricing matrices and job costs. And so we take our expertise on that ability to help people obviously with that. Then on top of that, what we've done is gone out and... Uh, basically, we're going to start investing in the new shift in technology with AI and different things like that. But that is just getting launched. If you're watching this, you know, in the next week or so, really getting launched right now, we just onboarded a few of our current clients through the process to make sure smooth and some of the updates are working the way they should. And uh, we're going to have a full-time support staff as well for that from eight to five Eastern. So that is kind of our diversification into owning our own platform and actually continuing uh, going the way technology is going. Yeah, man, watching the the growth at Simple Growth has been so cool because you have such a passion around helping business owners succeed. And I know that, you know, when I was first getting my feet wet and considering jumping out and starting my own business, you were one of those people along with like Jacob Godar, who was right there telling me like, you should do it. You'll, you'll do great. And so I know that it's not just when you're on people's podcasts or whatever that you're willing to help. I know from my own experience that when I have a question, you answer the phone. So Mike, if people want to check out Simple Growth, where can they find y'all online? Yeah. So Simple Growth uh, is going to be at Simple Growth Systems with an S.com. And our new product launch is actually going to be Simple Estimate uh, with two E's in there. So Simple Estimate Systems.com. And uh, we will be opening up the general public here probably in the next three to five days, just onboarding Uh, a couple of our our newer beta testers in just to make sure the onboarding process is smooth. But like I said, it's an existing product that we built upon Um, great reputation and uh, all the existing user base has just been transferred over to the simple estimate uh, rebrand and everything. So perfect timing if you want to check it out. And as you're looking at it too, I think the the interesting thing is there's a lot of products that are uh, using the AI now or adapting to that Cody, but what we're finding Mm -hmm. is the technology is there, but some of the machine learning, the algorithms, are not quite there yet in certain areas. So as we continue to develop that, something we're probably not gonna launch the AI part immediately, we're gonna let the machine learning kind of learn from people coloring in and the database pulls. 
Uh, right now, it does give the is ability. The, sorry, I want to on the machine learning side. Is y'all's goal to have it like highlight the service area for the customer who's requesting a quote? Correct. Yeah, and then they'd be, they'd be able to adjust oh, it cool. in and out. Yeah. Right now, in its current state, wherever the customer colors in, uh, right now we're inter- we've integrated with Service Autopilot. We're going to be integrating pretty shortly with Copilot and Jobber, amongst possibly even Yardbook. But that's we've got with the platform we bought the the integration piece was already kind of there built. So we we've got mm-hmm. you know basically a head start on it. So that's going to be the easy part. The cool thing is like when it goes into your software. So whether it was Service Autopilot or Copilot or Yardbook or Jobber, it actually is going to take the uh, coloring screenshot when they submit it. So you as the business owner can confirm they actually colored the full property and a link to the, the image is actually updated on the client notes on your file. So in Service Autopilot, for instance, you can go in, click on that. It pulls up the actual picture to confirm it. Make sure that they didn't do a little dot to get a lower quote. Yeah, and in addition, we've also tied into the Clarent PCI compliant credit card form. So when they fill out that, it's one seamless process and that's actually pushed into your service autopilot instance. Like I said, we're working on other integrations right now. We've got a team of almost 30 full-time people now between the Simple Estimate and Simple Growth team. So it's not like we've just started out in business. We were going on our fifth year, past our fifth year now, and that's uh, I think that's the credit to the team. I've, I've kind of stepped back and that leadership team is really driving that. I've got at least nine or 10 people on the team that have all owned million dollar plus companies. All of you service autopilot or the other platforms I'm talking about and, and they get it. So it's not somebody coming in that doesn't understand a service business. And that's, I think, where we kind of stand out. That's what we're different because a lot of people want to know what's different between you and service autopilot or this other competitor. Uh, you've got a team of full people that really care. They want to help you hopefully not make the mistakes I made in my business, but just empower you to leverage technology to, to buy that time back. Yeah. You have built an incredible team. And I know that we're, we're getting some interviews with a few of your guys on the podcast coming up soon. So awesome. hopefully people will, will stay tuned for that guys. If you have hung out for the whole video with me and Mike putting on a party in room 112. Please leave us a like down below. Make sure you are subscribed. This is the kind of interview that we do here on the podcast. This is the kind of content that we put out multiple times a week. I learned that, you know, super heavy content strategy from Mike. So it was really good to get you on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Cody, appreciate it, bro. I can't thank you enough. You've turned in like a regular Mr. Beast. Like, click, share, and send. I love it, brother. I got to take some notes from you now. So appreciate you having us. Hopefully we get back on. But uh, thanks again for everything you're doing in the uh, lawn care and landscape industry.